Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. What a wonderful day for a baptism. No rain, nice and blue skies, it's lovely. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for sharing this day with us. Uh, our call to worship this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. We gather today as God's people. God calls us to go and to share the good news. We gather as God sent out people. We gather to listen and to share. God works in our lives. We proclaim the goodness of God's love together. We gather to respond to God's grace and we continue along our paths of discipleship. We gather to hear the call from God and we say yes to God as we come together to worship. Let us join together in our first hymn as we sing Be Thou My Vision. <coughs>
we share in a time of prayers, of adoration and confession. Jesus, we bow in wonder at the expanse of your embrace, the breadth of your inclusion, the surprise of your grace. You seek us and seek us again, including those we write off as beyond hope, the outcasts, the public sinners, the self-serving, those who collaborate with evil and the oppression. Why are we surprised? Your desire is for mercy, not sacrifice. You are the great physician, coming to the most needy, those who are in need of healing. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for forgetting who you are. Forgive us for forgetting our own sin and isolation and collaboration. Forgive us for judging. Forgive us for self-righteousness. Forgive us for limiting you when we are so desperately in need of who you are. We are those most in need. Lord, create in us clean hearts and renew your spirit within us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us all. Amen. We're moving into our time of baptism, and uh, I was told that this is a, a baptism song that's used widely across the United Church, and especially here in Calandra, so we're going to join together as we sing Father Welcomes All His Children.
the meaning of baptism. Obeying the word of the Lord Jesus and confidence in his promises, the church baptises those who he has called. Baptise in the sign of new life in Christ, by water and of Holy Spirit. We are brought into union with Christ in his death and his resurrection. In baptism, we are sealed and with the Holy Spirit, made members of the body of Christ and called to his ministry in the word. Scott and Camille, what do you ask of the church for Blake and Kayla? In the light of the covenant promise and of your request, I ask you now, do you believe that the gospel enables us to turn from darkness of evil and walk in the light of Christ? Blake and Caleb, may the Lord open your ears to receive his word and your mouths to confess faith into which you are baptised. Let us all join together as we stand and share the words on the screen. <clears throat> Let us confess the faith into which we are baptised. Do you believe in God who made you and loves you? I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Saviour and Lord? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who has received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the continuing work of, your, of our salvation? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The prayer of thanksgiving. Eternal God, we thank you for the gifts of water. In the beginning you moved over the waters to bring out order over chaos. From the great floods in the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark. Through the Red Sea, you led your people to freedom from slavery in Egypt. Across the River Jordan, you led Israel to the land you promised. In the waters of the Jordan, our Lord was baptised by John and anointed by the Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, bless this water and these children who are baptised in it, that they may be born anew of water and of spirits, be raised in new life in Christ and continue to be his faithful disciples through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom and with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory and praise now and forever. Would you like to come over this a little bit? Thank you. So little children, for you Jesus Christ has come and he lives for you and he has endured agony of Gethsemane and the darkness of Calvary. For you, he has uttered the cry, it is accomplished. For you, he has triumphed over death. For you, he praised at, uh, prays at God's right hand. All for you, little children, even though you do not know it. In baptism, the words of the apostle is fulfilled. We love because Christ has first loved us. Blake. I'm going to come in. I might lift you up. Are you a bit heavy? I'm going to put your head forward. Blake, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Kayla, you going to come to me? Oh, yes. You're okay. Caleb, I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good girl. <laughs> Blake and Caleb are now received into the Holy Catholic Church according to Christ's commands. Let us sing together.
I ask you now to respond to God's gracious, that graciousness to Blake and Kayla by making these solemn promises. Will you provide for Blake and Kayla a Christian home of love and trust and surround them with such things that are pure, true, lovely and of good report? Will you set before Blake and Kayla the example of a Christian life and will you pray that they will learn the way of Christ? We will. We encourage Blake and Kayla to grow in the fellowship of the church so that they may come to faith in Christ. The people of God gathered here this morning. I invite you to welcome Blake and Kayla. Blake and Kayla. With God's help, we will care for you. Blake and Kayla, we will pray for you. Blake and Kayla. I charge you, the people gathered here, to maintain the life of worship, service and justice, that these children and all the children among you may grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the knowledge and love of God. With God's help, we will live out our baptism as a loving community in Christ. Almighty God, we praise you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for declaring your love for Blake and Kayla today, even before they can understand. As you have loved them from the beginning, continue to protect them and guide them. May they become a loyal disciple of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your goodness to Scott and to Camille. Grant your blessing upon their home and help them to keep the promises they have made. We pray for ourselves, who are easily I forget your grace, and by sharing in this mystery, we now recall our own baptism and continue to walk in the light of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You belong to Christ, the light of the world. Blake and Kayla, may you always walk as a child of the light. Let your light so shine before the world that all may see your good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. Shall we pray? The blessing of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Well done. <laughs> Let's welcome Blake and Kayla. receive the children into the family of God and also this morning we're going to share in our time of offering and uh, we acknowledge those who have shared already in their giving and those of you who want to share this morning we're welcoming your gifts now thank you Shall we pray? 
Mighty God, we are so grateful for the blessings that you have given to us in our lives. Lord, we pray that these tokens of our gifts of respect and honour to you will be extended for your kingdom here. Lord, bless us and use us as we continue to worship your name. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will give you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And to you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the Oak of Morah. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said to, and said, to your offering, I will give this land. So he built there an, offer to, an, offer, an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent at Bethel on the west of Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on by stages towards the Negev. And the New Testament reading comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13 and 18 to 26. The calling of Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of their position, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. A girl restored to life and a woman healed. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that land, that district. <coughs> for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. As I mentioned last week, uh, this week starts the season of ordinary times. Not ordinary in the sense of commonplace, but in the sense of ordinal or serial in the approach that we read the scriptures. So review this ordinary times uh, a six-month step-by-step pilgrimage through the story of Jesus' life and ministry. 
This year we focus on Matthew, next year the lecture focuses on Mark and then Luke and John's Gospel is sprinkled throughout all three years in the cycle. So the Christian year is like the tides, coming and going. The festival seasons of Christmas and Easter giving way to the season of everyday life. A chance to take stock, a chance to dig into what life in faith is all about. And so we begin this Sunday with two stories, centuries apart, but both stories are stories of calling. Abram, as we heard there, later known as Abraham, and Matthew's calling. The passage from Genesis begins with the saga of Abraham and Sarah, the story that is, in many ways sets in motion the historical narrative of the Jewish people. Genesis 1, 1 to 11, covers the so-called primeval history, an ordered account of the ancient stories gathered together from different eras and authors, each with distinctive mythological styles. First is the story of creation, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and so on. Second, the story of Noah's family, the flood, and the ark. And then the Tower of Babel, and the dispersing of the people into their many language groups. With this history as background, in Genesis 12, the storytelling focuses and, and the style changes. They take a shift, and for the next 10 chapters, we'll read of the saga of Abraham and Sarah. And then in Matthew 1 to 8, lays out the stories of Jesus' birth, the baptism many years later, his temptation in the wilderness, the first major sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and then several stories of Jesus' healing. Before the Sermon on the Mount, the initial disciples Jesus called were fishermen from the shores of the Galilee. But here in chapter 9, he calls Matthew, Matthew the tax collector. Jesus is on the verge of sending out his people, the twelve, to heal and to preach the gospel. And Matthew is apparently the twelfth and final disciple recruited and welcomed into the fold. Those who Jesus would have been addressing with his sermons would have been at least familiar with the purity practices of the time recorded in the Hebrew scriptures. For example, how menstruating women were seen as to be unclean in Leviticus 12, 1 to 8, and 15, 19 to 30. And we read in Numbers 19, 11 to 13, that the same is true of dead bodies, meaning that anybody who touches a dead body is also unclean. And for the most part, these tax collectors were widely hated, despised as instruments of the Roman occupiers and their collaborators. Jesus uses the tax collectors in his Sermon on the Mount as shorthand for people lacking in morality in Matthew 5 and 46. As we heard, Jesus overturns all of these ideas in this, in this week's reading. And bearing that in mind, it helps highlight the tensions driving uh, the division and the narrative forward. Is he really eating with the tax collectors, the Pharisees say, the sinners? Did she, an unclean woman, really touch the hem of the holy teacher? Did he really touch this dead stranger's corpse? As we look at today's gospel reading, Jesus has been on the move throughout the countryside, and he comes to across Matthew sitting in his tax booth. Matthew, like many uh, of customs officials at the time, he was likely to have been charging taxes and tolls on all goods being taken to the market for sale. And in that region, the fishermen were prevalent. They would have been taxed on every fish that they had caught and taken to market. Tax collectors were very unpopular, not only because that they were under the Roman rule and giving taxes to the Roman Empire, but also because these tax collectors were often suspects of charging more than they were due and pocketing the difference for themselves, getting rich off the misfortune of their own people. How striking then is it that Jesus would call such an undesirable person to be his twelfth disciple? A surprise highlighted by the reactions of, made by the Pharisees. But it's also worth noting that Jesus' other disciples, many of whom were fishermen, were probably not uh, a lot of love lost for tax collectors from them. By choosing and calling Matthew, 
Jesus is making a statement, not just to outsiders observing him, but also to his own people, to those who followed him and knew him. Jesus, in making this appointment, is saying to everybody else that no one is disqualified from following me. This is my way. No one is barred from becoming a part of the Jesus movement. In fact, Jesus is um, seen to be most interested in those people who have the most needs. Just as a doctor is interested in people who are sick. Throughout the opening chapters of Matthew, it is clear that Jesus has been portrayed as a healer. He comes not to reward those who are already well, but rather he is here to help those who need to become well. When we consider this interaction between Jesus and the woman on the roadside in verse 21 of our reading, we learn that she has been bleeding for 12 years and she reasons to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be made well. The underlying word here, translated as be made well in the NRSV version, is the Greek word sozo, which is also translated as to save, or heal, or pres uh, preserve, or to rescue. The woman has been removed from society, cast aside, seen as an outsider, left alone, deemed unclean, by everybody, and yet she audaciously pursues salvation. Not only does she push her way through the crowd, touching people, but she makes her way past the entourage of disciples, and she touches the cloak of Jesus. But she also has to push through the words and the narrative from Leviticus as well. The ancient idea that she is not only unclean, but anybody who touches her will become unclean as well, including the one whose clothing she desperately seeks to hold. Just think about that for a moment. Somebody unclean for so long, outcast, the woman touches the holy man. What must the disciples have thought? The panic and stress must have come across them. What's gonna to happen to Jesus? What about his reaction? What would it mean for him to be unclean? Will he be angry? Will he condemn her? And Jesus turns, instantly praises the woman for being so bold as to reach out and to touch him. Her daring nature pushes past so many. Her persistence to keep surviving for so many years. Her faith that even touching the one who could save her will be enough. Take heart, my daughter, your faith has been made you well. Again, this word so-so, faith. Instead of drawing attention towards his powers and the might that he had to be able to heal her just by her touching her, him, Jesus instead draws attention to the woman's power, to her tenacity, to her faith. And so after this interaction, Jesus continues on his journey to the house of the local leader from the synagogue, a man whose daughter has just died. With boldness that mirrors the woman's faith, the man believes that Jesus can touch his daughter and make her live once more. Again, the Greek is helpful in this instance. The word live here is translated as zoa, which is the same word that we see in Matthew 4 and 4. One does not live on bread alone. When Jesus arrives at the house, he tells the mourners to leave. Go, and he goes to her bedside. And he takes her hand and instantly the girl gets up. She is alive again. Once again, the actions that Jesus has dissolves the barriers that are erected by man. Barriers between clean and unclean. Barriers between death and life. In both cases, the story foretells the narratives of Jesus' death and resurrection, as well as the promise of this broader resurrection for us to follow. The idea of audacious faith is at least as old as the story of Abraham and Sarah, the saga that starts with God calling Abraham to go from his country and his family and his home to a land that God will show him in Genesis 12 and 1. At least two things stand out in this ancient story. Firstly, it begins with God giving a powerful one-word directive, go. A summons to leave what is familiar and begin a life of adventure. And secondly, the purpose of calling isn't only for Abraham and Sarah and their family, but rather it is a calling for everyone. 
In you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 12 and 3. As Matthew arranges these encounters for his scripture, they are shared and a vivid theme. Jesus is inclusive. His actions, his words, they dissolve barriers that have been in place for time immemorial. They are healing, saving, and life-giving all at the same time. From beginning to end, these stories, the Jesus message takes this misconception and it dissolves them. Jesus doesn't choose life now over the eternal life, but rather the so-so, the faith, is broad enough to carry both connotations at the same time. The focus of Jesus' coming was not to save the righteous, but rather to save the outsiders, the unclean, the sinners, the forgotten, those who are cast aside, those who are in need of healing, of rest, of help. And yes, this includes the tax collectors too. For us as Christians today, this means showing care for those in society who are often looked down upon, or distrusted, or otherwise disrespected and removed. Even as society might count them out, Jesus counts them in. In Matthew's Gospel, a common theme is that Jesus' teachings are dissolving the socio-political barriers between Jews and Gentiles and breaking down the barriers between religious groups that raise up contempt and division between many. For Christians today, the task is to identify and remove the Christian practices that implicitly or explicitly create barriers and separation, creating the in-crowd and the out-crowd. The stories from Matthew's Gospel provide a glimpse of how Jesus thinks about these scriptures. How uh, he engages is not as if every word in Leviticus, or any other book for that matter, is to be taken at face value, but rather that it is a wise rabbinical judgment, carefully weighing which passages are important, which passages help illuminate others, and then applying the results at the right time, in the right situation, in the right place, with the right people, in the right way. Remember, love your neighbour was first in Leviticus 19 and 18. Faith here is framed from the barrier-dissolving boldness that the woman who was hemorrhaging is cast. She is a role model alongside the local religious leader. On one hand, an outcast, and yet on the other hand, an insider. Both demonstrating audacious tenacity that Jesus calls faith, which is a powerful possession owned and held by every part of humanity. This is so so your faith has made you well now this isn't to suggest that a conclusion be made that in the absence of healing or a cure means that the person who is afflicted is a blame of lack of faith the fact that so so or faith and zoa live have such wide-ranging meanings that in these stories from salvation to health from resurrection to thriving from restoration to community highlights that in fact healing comes in many different ways physical emotional social and otherwise and we can trust the most daring faith faithful actions will be met by god's merciful and faithful healing after all that is jesus message of encouragement here is the good news of the gospel in these stories he is saying follow me yes you i know your past and I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in your future. I'm calling you to something new. Take heart, my children. Rest out, uh, reach out to me. Push through the barriers. Dare to believe. Dare to touch my garment. Because when you do so, you'll find that I'm already reaching out to you. I'll take you by the hand, both in the here and the now and in the time to come. I'm calling you to get up and to go and to be set free. Rise up. In Romans 3, 29, Paul asks a provocative rhetorical question. Is God the God of the Jews only? Jews, of course, identify Abraham as their founding father. Christians trace the lineage of Jesus Christ back to Matthew, back to him in Matthew 1 and 1. 
and the Muslims revere him as a friend of God and faith of the prophets and ancestors of Muhammad. In his singular journey, Abraham instigates this blessing for all the world. When God called him, Abraham subverted this conventional wisdom and moved beyond the understandable human fears of ignorance and inclusion and importance and instead of fearing inclusion, of being different, of the outsider, he gave himself to God's promise to, of unveiling this universal blessing for the whole earth. In the face of his profound inability, Abraham believed that God could do the impossible and in doing so, Abraham became the father to us all. Abraham moved beyond his fear of power, powerlessness to faith that God could quite literally make something out of nothing. I wonder what fears that we might have personally that we have to move beyond to experience this so-and-so in our lives and experience God's faith and promise for us as we live out those lives, as we serve others, how do we claim faith once more for ourselves? Shall we pray? Almighty God, in every way you surprise us. You give us hope for the future through your examples and your stories in the scriptures. Lord, we pray that as we continue to seek after you, that you remove things that are barriers for us to get closer to you, to understanding who you are in our lives. Lord, as we continue to worship your name, give us freedom to be your children. Give us courage to reach out and be blessed by you. Lord, go before us and use us for your kingdom. Amen. Let's continue in our worship as we sing this hymn of summons.
Heavenly Father, we bring before you the Universal Church, such a diverse family brought together as one through faith in you. We pray for those who may be different to us, those who may refer to as them or others, yet they are our brothers and sisters, seen, known and loved by you. Help your church to break down barriers, casting aside differences to work together and build your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Sovereign Lord, we pray for our uniting church, for the assembly, the synod, the presbyteries, and all that lead the church. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon them, to lead, to guide, and to sustain, sustain them. Lord, we pray for all people who minister here in Calandro. We thank you for their all that they do to gather here and worship, and ask that you will teach us all to recognise our gifts that you have given, both in ourselves and in others, so that they can be used to bless others, to glorify you and to build your kingdom. We pray, Lord, for those who do not yet know you, and for those who are taking the first steps of faith. We especially pray for the Harbury's family, for Blake and for Kayla, as they've been baptised into your family this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. God of justice, we pray for the leaders of our nation, that, that greed and ambition and unfair agendas will be wiped away, and that they may come under your rule. This seems like such a big ask, yet Lord, we know that you, there is nothing impossible to you. We pray with hope for a day where through good leadership, all people will be safe, with the at least basic human needs being met. Lord, in your mercy. God of all creation, we pray for our natural world and all of its resources. Help us each to live in a way that cares for this earth and to seek for ways to heal the damage that has already been done. We hear daily about the consequences brought on by poor stewardship of your creation. Lord, we bring before you those people, animals and countries who are suffering the most through the effects of these. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, each day as we listen to the news, we feel overwhelmed and helpless, for we bring before you those who seem to be in need. Lord, the things that we have seen and known about. Where your people are suffering, Lord, we pray for those caught up in the Indian train crash, for the wars across the world, for floods in Haiti, and anything else that is in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort and peace, as we sit in your presence, we bring our own prayers before you, and in the silence, listen for your voice of hope, love, and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is sent forth with God's blessing. Let us join together as we sing. Pray. May the waters of God's grace surround you and uphold you. May your baptism strengthen you and your work ahead. And may the spirits that descended upon Jesus at his baptism fall upon your shoulders as you seek to do God's will. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.